Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, and welcome to part three of our diversity and inclusion webinar series for historic places open to the public. This webinar will be recorded, as you were noted when you came in, and the recording will be available afterwards. So my name is Kirsten Vermacki, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a project manager with the National Trust for Canada. I'm a second generation Canadian settler and guest on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people in what is known as Ottawa. I want to recognize that our webinar participants live and work on the lands and territories of many Indigenous peoples across Canada and encourage you to reflect on the shared human experience of storytelling as placemaking and community building. It's through storytelling and truth seeking that we can learn from one another and create richer, more accurate stories of all of these places that are important to us. The National Trust is Canada's national charitable not for profit organization that leads and inspires action for places that matter, working with communities to save and renew historic places. At the National Trust, we're on a mission to bring heritage to life in ways that are more than just one. <laughs> We provide tools to save and renew historic places like Regeneration Works and a treasure trove of partner destinations to visit and discover. You can find us at our website or on our social media, all of which is linked right here. For today's webinar, I'd like to welcome back Karen Carter, the president and founder of Karen Carter and Associates Cultural Consulting. She is the former executive director of Heritage Toronto the founding executive director of Myzeum of Toronto and co-founder of Black Artists Network and Dialogue, an organization dedicated to the promotion of Black arts and culture in Canada and abroad. Karen's most recent project is as co-founder of the BIPOC Fellowship to help support the development of a more diverse cultural landscape in Canada. Joining Karen in discussion today, I'd like to welcome Kuiawa Jones. Kui describes herself as a Haida artist, curator, and fisherman. She has worked with the Haida Heritage Center, Vancouver Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, the McCord Museum, and Bill Reed Gallery as a community leader, curator, and artist. Kui is currently working as a classical tattoo artist at the Haida and a fisherman throughout the summer seasons, and is bringing her wealth of experience in intercultural relationships, tourism, and engagement here today. This webinar series will be available as part of our Diversity and Inclusion Historic Places Resource Kit for Historic Places Day 2023, and is made possible with support from the Government of Canada. You will have noticed that today's event is being held in meeting format. The majority of our time together will be an opportunity for attendees to ask Karen and Kui questions about putting the concepts of diversity and inclusion into practice. This session is our opportunity to all learn from one another. So please feel free to keep your cameras on. And once the discussion opens, if you'd like to ask a question, you can simply just raise your hand using the controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll call on you. I'll also be monitoring the chat for questions if you'd like me to read it out loud on your behalf. Some people have also submitted questions via email, so I'll be posing those on behalf of them as well. Vous pouvez poser des questions en français aussi. I'll give a brief overview of the Trust Historic Places Days program, as well as an introduction to our efforts so far in promoting diversity and inclusion in historic spaces open to the public. Karen and Kui will take over and begin the discussion on engaging with the concepts of diversity and inclusion in historic places. Part one and two of this series took place in December and January and introduced us to some of the concepts that Karen and Kui will be exploring today, including finding new voices for your historic site, building culturally safe spaces for staff and visitors, and how to begin difficult conversations within your organization. It isn't necessary to have attended part one and two to be able to engage with us today, but links to all webinars will be included in the follow-up email to today's event. So briefly, if you are new to Historic Places Days, it is an annual national multi-day event in July, and it's designed to shine a spotlight on historic places from coast to coast to coast. It's an opportunity to gain profile and visitors, and it exists as much online as it does in person and on the ground. The Trust is happy to be the lead partner to make Historic Places Days happen. We appreciate greatly the participation and support of Parks Canada and close to 600 participating historic sites across the country, including attendance in person of almost over 350,000 people last year for the month of July. 
In 2022, the trust took a particular interest in creating more diverse content and building intentional relationships. So the strategy was to take a regional focus and partner with organizations and individuals doing work on telling fuller, more diverse stories. A significant challenge to diversity is that built heritage generally remains, for many, at its essence, a colonial project. As such, 2022 was an opportunity to reconsider and grow understanding of where the conversation about historic sites and built heritage fits into the larger work of inclusion, accessibility, decolonization, and reconciliation. We know that there are many stories that have been ignored or erased, and that communities across the country lack the resources or the support to fully share their story. Now, with a specific goal to tell more diverse stories and include more equity-seeking groups, the Trust reached out to establish partners across Canada to develop connections with historic places that tell underrepresented stories. Funding was offered to community groups to encourage sites to create a listing on the HPD website, share their on-site events, and curate content and visit lists like the ones you see here on the screen, um, including in Alberta and in New Brunswick. Heritage leaders in historic places are increasingly recognizing the imperative to build relationships, reach new audiences, and make space for narratives that tell a more inclusive story of Canada. It can be difficult to know where to start this process. And so this series of webinars introduces these concepts and addresses some of the unique challenges that historic places face in Canada. These three webinars form the core of the Diversity and Inclusion Resource Kit for Historic Places, which will be released later this spring in time for Historic Places Days 2023. We will include links to further learning opportunities and resources to complement the conversations that Karen has shared here online with us throughout the last few months. So that quick introduction, I'd like to pass it over to Karen Carter to begin the discussion with Qui. You can start asking your questions in the chat at any time. I'll be monitoring the chat and Karen will open up the floor to on-camera questions once the sort of conversation has started going and, and uh, these two ladies have shared some great information. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and send it over to Karen. Thank you. Um, we are probably going to take up about 20 minutes of in conversation between Queen and myself and then uh, we will put it out to the group uh, because as Christian indicated, I think you guys have heard enough of me over the last few months and I really wanted a chance to make this um, final session more interactive. So feel free to um, ask a question. Uh, as they would say in grade school, there are no such thing as bad or stupid questions. So whatever um, is on your mind that you wanna share um, or would like us to give some feedback or comment on, please. Uh, feel free because it would be nice, as we all know, if this was in person, I don't know about you, but I'm missing a human contact uh, for discussions like these. I think they're more effective that way if they're in person. But, you know, since we got to do what we got to do on the Zoom, uh, we will take that and uh, run with it. So good afternoon. I guess it's morning for you, my friend on the West Coast. Did you fish this morning? I can't hear you. You got to take off your mute. You're still on mute, we. Oh, the wonders of technology. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I was fishing, but no, it's, it's we're we're getting amped up for next weekend and we're gonna go get some halibut. So it's gonna be great. Uh, okay. Uh I like halibut. Can I can you save me some or send me some? Uh maybe you should come visit and I can bring I you. I knew you were gonna say that. Maybe you should come <laughs> visit and get some halibut. <laughs> yeah. Um so I, I wanted to just give some context for first just how we met because I think some of what we're working on uh, with the project in Northern Alberta with the uh, Buffaloes is an interesting way to kind of frame the discussion around just this idea of understanding what heritage uh, means for uh, uh, many of us in 21st century because I think um, organizations like the Trust, some may have come to know it through advocacy and work around the built form. Yeah. But a lot of us also understand that um, for, and I think we share this as uh, someone uh, descendant from people of African descent whose existence in this part of the world has come through forced migration. Um, and obviously your uh, Indigenous communities, there's a real understanding of the importance of land for people who are Indigenous or descendants from, or have an understanding of their Indigenous 
history from their indigenous descendants that the the heritage of the land is paramount over everything else. So I wonder if you maybe want to talk a little bit about just the work that you do and the importance of the land in the kind of your day to day uh, uh, in the in the community. Um. Well, I grew up with a family and we really do belong to the ocean and the land um, where we like food gather and like bring that like bounty to people that can do it for themselves. So it's like single parents, it's people with, you know, ailments and um there's like a humbleness that comes with that because you're in the elements and we really uh, are, are we, we have, I call it the blacklist, like, you know, that we like bring to like people and we show up in, you know, the chariot and um, bring people food essentially that can't do it for themselves and I think that that's not as common as you know you think because they're like a lot of people are agriculturalists but we are hunters and gatherers so I think um we're humble to the land and a part of it versus owning it and that that's like something that is I think powerful in its own and uh, you know a, a journey that that we live every day and that's how I grew up. Um, we had I mean we've had a couple of pre-discussions as you know when you're preparing for these things and one of the things that was struck that struck me which was one of the reasons for inviting you into this conversation was the uh, aspects you shared regarding the work that the Haida have done, uh, the work uh, for that community of indigenous folks and the, the place um, kind of where, as you said, they were the last to be hit because of being on the West so that the, um, the colonizers impact to some extent um, was foreshadowed because they, so they were more prepared to some extent. And uh, we know that the Holocaust of indigenous lives in this, um, in, in the Americas because of uh, contact, but we also know that there are indigenous communities who are uh, really still rich in their language and aware of their cultures. And so I may, I wonder if you want to talk a bit about some of the work that has been done uh, for your communities in that, and just the importance, as you say, of the land, like the 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 teachings and all these things that happen uh, for you growing up that are just intrinsically a part of your day to day DNA. Okay, that's a fantastic uh, conversation, um, and I can probably talk all day about this, but uh, like really the the Haida are the last to be hit by colonization so we're going to be the first to like punch back and make an an opportunity for people to see how wonderful this like indigenous life can be and like it hasn't been easy but there's been uh almost like a gazelle level of uh in like heightenedness that has happened from like the 80s so i was like three years old and they were like holding a protest not even a protest it was a stand we were standing up for our own laws as like indigenous people and our laws encompass um you know diversity and and biodiversity and um the forest and so our our people my grandparents my parents um my family my cousins all like kind of stood up and 77 people got um uh arrested in standing up for that 
diversity and for that forest and for that like old growth and old growth is like a uh a very rare thing so from and and because they stood up and said no more destruction to the natural world um today now there's uh a th third of Haida Gwaii that is protected um and it's protected from mountain top to sea floor so it's like not you know it's it's very inclusive and like thoughtful and there's other places being protected and we have like a uh uh community of people that go to these areas and they're called the watchmen and they protect um they protect the areas and also share you know like it, it's you know, share with people that that come uh to these areas about the culture about the place and that's i think a pretty spectacular model of like reconciliation way before reconciliation was really kind of recognized so yeah um talk, should we talk a little bit about um this idea of diversity, equity, access, and inclusion as it relates to engagement. So I'm gonna get kind of to a practical aspect of why folks are here, which is, I think as we both know, there's, I think it's part the unknown, part fear of the unknown, where people who are often doing work in arts, culture, and heritage communities are nervous about connecting with local racialized and indigenous peoples. And so uh, I wonder what you would say if you're, you know, living in a community and there's someone there who is not from your particular background, they're doing work in the heritage sector uh, and they want to reach out, how would you suggest that they go about this? So we just, let's shift a bit maybe to the practical of I've I've I know what my methodology is, so let's start with yours, and then we'll see where we land. All right. Well, I think I'm Haida, so we're like pretty dominant people, and don't really take it. So I mean, stuff. Sorry, I didn't mean to swear. Um, uh, we we really own our land, and when you come to Haida Gwaii, um, you know you're on Haida land. And um, it's been a difficult journey as like a curator in the city. Like I've had to like prove myself as someone worthy enough to even throw down like an exhibition or a show or a program over and over. So I think that there's got to be some sort of gentleness behind everything and like gentleness is uh key to kind of figuring it out and it has to be on both sides and you know we like as indigenous people we don't necessarily need to to accommodate and i think it's also scary that people say well what like can you speak for your people so I, I think it it needs to be like a collective, thoughtful, kind of like bring a lot of people in and like talk to them about like what you're doing versus, oh, I, I have one Indigenous person that, um, you know, can answer it all. And I, I don't think that's fair to that person. So I think like collectively, like bringing people in, sharing with them, having ideas together, maybe having a meal, like some great food and like talking goes way further than, um, uh, you know, relying on, on just one person. And that's kind of the irritating part 
and kind of the hardest part of being like an indigenous curator and i'll just tell you one story they actually saved like the west side of Haida Gwaii, uh the Haidas and what they did was like set up like a a huge table in the middle of the logging road and then all the ladies and men served out this huge meal to the loggers and they all like hung out together and had a conversation and they were able to save like a huge part from like destruction so like i think some food some people goes a long way and it can be very powerful just to have beautiful conversations when your time is full. Yeah, so uh, the the idea then is to not necessarily go with a big formal project or a big formal ask, but just to find ways to engage socially, which as we both know, sometimes that is if there's um, events or projects, a powwow or just something that's being hosted in uh an indigenous community that the public is able to attend that you attend and then just start to connect with people that way uh or as you say that the invitation goes from you to uh members of the community and the the big hook there is members um so that it there it feels like it's a invitation to the group not to an individual because you're right i think Often we start to think, and maybe this is a city thing because everybody's so busy, is let's just find one person, let's have a discussion with them, figure out how that one person could be our person that then helps us to make all these other connections. And uh, I think similar to Black communities, we have this thing where we say the idea that you're the only one in the room should always make you nervous. If you look around a room and you see that you are the only Black person or the only racialized person there, you'd be like, should I be in this room? Because why is this room void of more representation of uh, diverse people? So that idea of thinking about connecting community to community, uh, I think is a really good good point. Yeah, I think, I think um you know we're all human and like human expression and like indigenous expression is going to be the lifeboat that carries us all through so like i don't know five or six years ago six years ago wait seven years ago uh jim hart put up a poll at ubc for reconciliation and it was all about residential schools and, um, you know, I, I still stand by this. It's like, there's some really difficult stories, but like through the art and through human and high level human expression, that's what's gonna carry us through, um, you know, these difficult stories. But I don't want people to necessarily like focus on that because like prelude to, those difficult stories like it's like this big and then you know there's like so much more crazy beautiful history and like places to engage that can give power to any human it doesn't matter who you are and what you do you can like draw power from like the land or the ocean or wherever you whatever you do so like i think we need to recognize those difficult things and and hold on to them and even feel them and cry over them um but we also have to recognize that there's this beautiful human history that um we can call upon that is indigenous and that is in the land that most of us live in that um can be can be adored you know it's just yeah, like there's there's that idea sometimes i think with especially black and indigenous communities in this country that it becomes a constant way of a trauma narrative where they're constantly bringing up uh our our traumas as a way in and it's sad because i think some of that is about as you know the 
the news will spin on the negativity around uh, particular communities before they'll spin on the positive, right? And so then people feel like, oh, that's my way and I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge my um, uh, uh, apology about the, uh, the trauma in some way. And people mean well, but then you're kind of like, I'm not getting up in the morning meditating on that traumatic history. I know that history happened, but as you said, you're so much more. And so that almost leads us into if you're doing historic places days and you want to do something that is commenting on diverse communities or even find ways for them in, it's, it, it's can you research something positive that's related to that site uh, as opposed to feeling the uh, the need to comment on the the trauma traumatic part of our histories. I I think like what could be really spectacular for everybody, you know, in this country is to go to a museum and kind of feel the old pieces that they see in those collections and like hope that they maybe go home. And like my dream is personally that we would have like a mass repatriation of objects, but it would educate everyone. And there's like so much um, elements to call on that would really shift and change how people think about indigenous people because we're we're like honestly facing like uh, Western movies where Italians were playing natives and like, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood was the hero and like, those are, those days are gone. And so, I, you know, there's this complex of, you know, this like white savior type thing. But I think at the end of the day, soulfully, that there's going to be, like, I would love to see a day where, you know, non-Indigenous people know all the plants around us, you know, or or have, like, a, a sincere connection to the land, because that's really what, what we are. And, and you know, I, I live for, like, the seasons on Haida Gwaii. I walk my dog in the same place all the time because I want to watch like the plants grow. I want to feel the tides. I want to like understand the world through its time, not ours. And so I, I, I would really, and I think Haida Gwaii is like a special place because like in our world, it's, it's, a lot different, you know, like I haven't been to a community where everyone knows it's Haida and like even the Yats Haidaga or the, the white people get up and sing our national anthem with us and they say Hawa, which is like thank you in our language. And so I, I would like to see more of that and I think that people can can do that like they can learn how to say thank you in whatever language where they live um that it, it it's a small gesture but i think it's actually quite huge and here it's like dominant and beautiful and everyone works together whereas like when i travel off island it's not the case so i think we can be like a model of what reconciliation looks like. And reconciliation really is, I think people connecting to the land, connecting to the water and respecting it. And the, that's once people understand that, they'll understand who we are. So that, I, I love that because it, it focuses on almost the need to take time for the small moments. I don't, I'm not sure what just happened, but I think people need to turn off their cameras and their mics because they're jumping. I think Chris Weeb is now the person who's on my screen. Um, uh, technology, bless it. Um, we're going to go to our happy place. So uh, just, just so 
uh, to reiterate, we have, um, uh, I think an opportunity, as you're saying, to look at the small moments, like something as simple as you said, is learning how to say hello in the local indigenous communities language. Um, taking the time, even if you're not in engaging with any indigenous communities, to respect the land, to walk the lands that you're on, to engage around the environmental elements. Because as you're, I think, reminding us, at the core of um, uh, indigenous communities in this country is, it's, I, I don't know anyone that I've engaged with across indigenous communities, which is mostly in the GTHA, because I'm in Toronto, who don't talk about the land being paramount like that. Their 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 communities cultural cultural. It's the reason they refer to this place as Turtle Island because it's a back to the narrative of the paramount need to respect the land. I'm going to use that as our um, four way, and also because I feel like when things are popping up on the screen unexpected, that's a sign from the universe for us to stop acting like we're chilling with each other and not letting everybody else in the conversation. I'm going to I'd suggest that we open it up. And if people already have questions uh, or comments, I would just say that if you have a comment, because I think it, we want to leave this space open for people to just really kind of uh, feel connected to the discussion, did that you just keep it brief. Um, I usually like to say soliloquies are not allowed. Uh, we all know Shakespeare and we all remember the soliloquies. So uh, if you keep your comments brief, we're happy to hear just what you're thinking or what's coming to mind. Uh, if you don't have a question, um, if it's an anecdote, uh, just so that we make as much room for people. I think we are going to uh, write to one or just before one. I'll let Christian tell me uh, when we're stopping. Um, but yeah, we're happy to switch to... Uh, the view of the gallery if people want to turn their cameras on so we can see you and we just see which hands go up and see if Christian already has some questions that she wants to take. It'll be nice to see some faces and uh, feel like we're hanging out together. Um, if you have lunch, you're uh, not allowed to eat it because I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm not at lunch, so that's the only rule. I don't want to see any lunch, maybe some coffee or water. But um, yeah, I'm literally sitting beside the half-eaten brunch sandwich that has not been finished. Um, so yeah, we'll throw it to you, Christian, to let us know which questions come next or comments. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'll let everyone sort of ruminate. Uh, again, if you want to ask a question with your camera and your mic, if you just want to put your hand up and I'll call on you, or um, the chat box is open if you prefer that I read your question, question out loud. Um, so I have a few questions that have been emailed to us um, previous to this meeting. So I'm just going to um, start addressing them and see if that kind of sparks anything in the group that we have going on as well. Um, so this is a question that comes in often and it was emailed more than once and it's for Quee, but I think Karen, you can also sort of uh, help us with this as well. And it's how do we begin a relationship with the indigenous community near us? They don't reply to our emails and we don't know who to contact. It's a very practical question we get all of the time. So do we have any sort of insight on that? Um, I think that, you know, being kind of the, I don't know if it's token native or the one that like answers those types of questions, um, it gets overwhelming at the end of the day. And um there's no real answer to that. There's like a lot of trauma and like things that are happening that kind of pull back or paralyze people to answer. And, you know, if they want uh, answers, there's ways to like kind of dig deeper and like find them. And that might be in the museum it might be um more thoughts about the trc um the the un undrip uh is also another interesting resource so i think um it's not that easy when you're the only native that you get called on for um 
and there's there's like a lot of trauma that people are dealing with so i think it, it it gets really overwhelming and there's not a lot of people and i think it's really uh weird to be exotic in your own land you know yeah i'll just yeah i'll just jump in to say it it i think part of this is it's that culture clash, right? Of especially when you're operating at an organizational level, you email and reach out to people all the time. And and mostly if they don't reply, you're kind of like, you didn't reply. Like I reached out, like what the what? Um, and so it's, I think Kui's comment is, uh, and I said this, I, I think I say this all the time is you give grace to get grace. So now for me, I think across the board in museums, because there's so much going on, in the heritage and culture sector broadly, is if I don't get a reply, I'm giving some grace. I'm assuming you don't know what people are going through. You don't know what's happening. Maybe you're not getting a reply because as Kree's saying, they're overwhelmed with everybody's emailing because as we know in the last couple of years with the heightened uh, focus on diversity, equity, access and inclusion conversations, uh, there's a lot of people reaching out to racialized communities with a particular focus on indigenous and black communities. So a lot of us are overwhelmed. So I would say go go with grace and assume, okay, I didn't get a reply. And then it's the what else can you do? And that's why I love Kui's comment about, are you spending time on the land? Are you, um, uh, maybe attending, look out for, is there events with, that are indigenous community focused that you can attend? Is there a friendship center? Like where are the public spaces where there are people working within indigenous culture organizations where you do get invited in? Is there a museum exhibition with indigenous um, uh, curators and artists? It's like, how do you find other ways into the conversation? And sometimes I know for me, it was a roundabout way I think if I'd been waiting for an email from the Mississaugas of the Credit, I would have probably never engaged. But then there was a roundabout way that we went to a powwow, spoke to some people. Uh, Carolyn King had been around, so I kind of know her. And then you you just ended up through, it's like, we're, we're programmed to think, here's the front door, I'm going to walk to the front door. And if I walk up to the door and no one answers then you walk away feeling dejected that you didn't get an answer. But then you forget that there's a garden, there's a park, there's the side door. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, where are the other ways in, right? And so it's think about that, but also, frankly, give yourself and give them grace because I'll also say in this moment that sometimes if you've been in a situation where stuff happened and you feel like that stuff's being held against you, they may not be ready to forgive you. So you give yourself grace and you pivot to another way to just continue to engage and educate yourself that isn't about that Indigenous community giving you the in, right? Because they're, as as so well stated by Kui, dealing with their own traumas at different levels across this country. So I think... Um, we're all programmed to engage in a particular way and we have to start rethinking what that looks like. I I also like would like to add to that and I think that like language goes a long way. It's like when you go to Mexico, you want to like say thank you in Spanish, you know, or whatever, you know, like wherever you go, you know, kind of when in Rome, but you're not in Rome. Like and I think like being able to say thank you in whatever place you're in at and like acknowledge like simply like the land and territory that you're on is super powerful. And like one of the the beautiful things about Haida Gwaii is that when we have a potlatch, we have like our own national anthem and the Yats Haida Gaz, or the white people iron people as we call them uh um you know get up and sing with us it's beautiful like they're a part of us you know we're a part of this like place together and so I think having that mentality to be grateful for where you are and like acknowledge it and I think land acknowledgements are huge but Land acknowledgements are nothing if you don't change who you are. So, like, if you can acknowledge people that were there for a long time, 
and like start to be a little bit of a, a part of that, even just through language and like language, I think that diversity of language will keep diversity in the natural world, you know, and I'm gonna um, jump in just quickly, Kaida to say we we know that you're in a special situation because you know a lot of indigenous communities have lost their language. So uh, but to your point, it's just that idea of what is the little that you can do through your own knowledge base and research. And in your particular region, because I think y'all are breathing special air out there, you you have your language. And I think as we know, a lot of communities don't necessarily, a lot of indigenous people have lost their language. I know black people have lost their language. So that, uh, that, that I think is uh, just to take that, because I feel like I'm, if I'm hearing that and I'm part of this group, I'd be like, how do I go about that if I can't get someone to reply to me? Yeah, uh, we, we only have like maybe 15 speakers left right oh, now. Okay. And they're all over like, you know, 70. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. there, there is like a fight for it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that like the non Haida people always say Hawa is really, I think, a good start. You know, Hawa means thank you in our language. And, um, and it's a comment it's, on the, the fact that you have had a strong invitation in that people have felt that they were, are able to come into that community, which some of that may be proximity, because as you said, because of the island, whereas for a lot of this country, it's not as easy to be in because the those communities are not directly connected to you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I yeah. think so. But I think that there's also opportunities and even acknowledging the place that you're in, because like a lot of places still have their indigenous name yeah. and indigenous mapping. And there is quite a bit of ethnology that was done because they they believed that, you know, in the early 1900s that all indigenous people were going to die. So they were trying to capture that. So there was like missions from ethnologists um, to study people. And so I, I think that's more like really prominent on the West Coast. I'm not entirely sure about yeah, the East you know, is a, is coast, but you have another um, question. Sorry, doll. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, make us both stop talking so that we let another question in or comment. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Um, so I have another question that came in by email, and I think this is this is uh, definitely someone I think Karen, who's been watching the other webinars, and has a specific question saying. What if our historic place tells a specific story about a topic that does not include BIPOC history? And sort of in brackets, like science, aviation, technology. Uh, why should we be looking for a different history to tell? And how does that not look like tokenism? I love the look on Val's face. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, Val. Uh, I, I might let you answer this question, Val, um, or jump in afterwards. Um, so I think sometimes a misunderstanding is that engaging with diverse communities, voices and experiences means you're talking, and we talked a bit about this, Kree and I, that it's trauma focused, that it's only about the harm and it's not about the lives lived and the successes. There's so much to do with invention, science, technology, anything, any, any aspects of the academy, you can find contributions from diverse communities to that. And so if your, if your historic place is about a science base, like I can off the top of my head come up with Black people who I know have been doing amazing things in science. There's this um, a scientist uh, whose name uh, Francis Jeffers, who had this program called Visions of Science that actually looked at Black inventors across Canada. The, the It's a Black man who helped to invent the machine that people use for kidney dialysis. I think if you look through, um, uh, if you literally, I think, just Googled uh, Indigenous inventors or Black inventors 
or indigenous scientists or black scientists or just scientists from diverse backgrounds, you would come up with names. So I think one of the, th and this is why this conversation for me with, with a fisher woman, a curator and an artist, it's kind of this reminder that the, the everyday practical human condition is what we all forget about. We forget to show up with our humanity and engage with the other in the same human way. Just as we all come from all these different stories at, or with knowledge of these different stories, experiences and peoples and backgrounds, all of that doesn't change because you're suddenly in diversity, equity, access, inclusion mode. But sometimes we're kind of like, what's the, let me deal with the, how do I talk about slavery? Or how do I deal with the slave ships? Or how do I deal with the trauma of loss for, you know, what happened with the um, indigenous uh, residential schools and the bodies that are being found? Like when you get caught up in the trauma narrative and actually if you're in a museum or heritage or historic place that is science or some other particular lane, it's actually a really good time to look at the human stories from these different people and not be focused on the trauma. Because frankly, as Kui said, and Lord knows I know, we're all over the trauma. I get up in the morning and I'm not weighed down by slavery. I'm here, I'm now, and I know that history. But I'm also just excited to be alive and excited to be a human being. And sometimes I just want to be that, a fellow human being. Sorry, that's my rant. I don't know if, uh, I feel like we should let somebody else talk. Do you want to jump in, Val? Sonia, I also saw you nodding. Or was it Emma? I'm going to call on you just because you're there. And I want to hear other voices. No, you got nothing for me. Uh, I hear you from the secular Jewish perspective. It becomes the like, oh yeah, tell me like, so how was your family impacted by the Holocaust? Yeah. I just learned about pogroms. How many people did your family lose? It's like, yeah, it's there. And yeah. I feel like there, it's true. When, if you start to think about it, every culture, most settler cultures have that. Like in Nova Scotia, I am sure there are Scots who don't want to hear another word about the Highland clearances and the preservation of language. Not that anyone thinks it's not important. Not that there are people who wake up every day and that's their bread and butter. But yeah. I think you're right, like particularly with communities of color, like my partner's Japanese Canadian and he, he does not think about internment on a daily, I mean, he works at Pier 21. So he probably does currently <laughs> actually think about internment on a daily basis. But, you know, in his yeah. day, on the weekends, not so much. <laughs> He's just a but human being. He'd like to just be a human being. Yeah, I think also like as, as white people, if we can think about diversity in our own, sometimes it helps me to flip it yeah. so that like I take almost a white centric, okay, if I was, if I was having that happen to me and someone was saying Holocaust, Holocaust all the time, wouldn't I want to like, you know, say, no, can we talk about sunshine and rainbows and inventors? Like, I think you can use your privilege sometimes to, a, to, you can, you can make it work. Like you, you can, can use it as a reminder. Work. Yeah. In that way, and I think yeah. so. It's like, it's it's hard, but we can we can actually use whiteness to sometimes get us where we need to go to give people who don't have that privilege space. Great. Sorry, Karen. You make me want to rant too, in the best way possible. <laughs> I'm all about a good rant. <laughs> I know. He is also all about a good rant. I think you've seen that from both of us. So we encourage a rant. No, it's, I think it's really, really important. I love your reference to the Scottish. My reference is usually the Irish. And it's like, they don't want to hear about the famine. I, I was on a board and it's just like, no, you, we are human beings. And I think the thing that we need to push past is your, the curiosity about the other should just be a part of you as a human being, being curious about others as a human being. And so if you come to your inquiry around diverse narratives that way, it just makes it a lot easier. And especially if you say, just start by the grace. I don't know. Like I'm gonna say that I'm I'm oblivious. And so if I say the wrong thing or move the wrong way, just let me know. But I'm here because I'm interested in just getting to know a fellow human being. Can I just put a suggestion folks were asking about where to reach community and if you're near a university I know that this has happened often in the immigration immigrant community so I was reaching out to the university so that you're hitting students mm -hmm. so as students I find are less intimidating because I'm older than them um but also because like 
they're often not doing as much of that labor as older folks are. And I know there's like, there is a respect and we want to listen to elders of all communities, but students are sometimes really interested in being engaged. So if you have a university, even if it's not super close, that is reaching out to their native friendship center or their black student association or their Indian student, whatever it is, can be really helpful. And you might also get a more diversity of opinions and experiences because universities won't necessarily just have folks from that community. Like they'll yeah. have folks from all over the country or, you know, if it's black folks from all over the world, yeah, just agree. another suggestion as a way to share the, was that your the burden? I don't know, bug a wider range of folks. Yeah, I was going to say, to ask Christian if she wanted to read that, because it's a really good answer, your your comment that you wrote. And so yeah, I, I like the highlight of the university part, because I think you're right. Um, uh, universities, and again, we know museums and other heritage organizations that are also have their other issues, but you'll sometimes just by volunteering, meet other volunteers and just get people that are, um, just makes it feel more accessible as a way to, as I said, side door, garden, back door, like just other ways of trying to make your way into the conversation. You're muted. Um, I don't know why I muted, that's weird. Uh, but um, like for the whole, like, what if you're in a place and, you know, it's not BIPOC and you can just you know, do whatever, because there's, I, I, I think that's just, like, a human question about, like, tapping into a place that you're in, and I've been to some very powerful places, um, you know, from Santa Fe to Thailand to, you know, Australia to here, but I think that there's like a humanity in like tapping into those places and like being human and being powerful about it. And powerful means being also respectable. And those are, are things that I think can really drive humanity forward versus looking at BIPOC or whatever, you know, like I, I, I think you can tap in to places no matter who you are yeah that's a good point because sometimes the focus on this is the thing we have to all focus on now we forget to just be curious about human beings and not be hyper focused or hyper uh, um, kind of focused on getting just to the racialized narrative because sometimes if your comfort is just about other community narratives as we know, whiteness is not a monolith, like race is a social um, uh, uh, structure, it's a social condition. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird myth uh, where we try to, to lump people according to groups and then forget about the diversities within each of those groups, right? Well, um, I, I know we're at 12.55, uh, sorry, Kai, I, I may, uh, we may give you the last word. I just wanted to check in with Christian to make sure that it was okay. Were you okay? Okay. Um, I, I, I think any human inspired by a place is beautiful. That's it. I know what it's like. I've been there. I do that all the time. So I think offering the opportunity to anyone to be inspired is um, wherever they are, whoever they are. Uh, is going to be what's going to drive humanity to not extinction. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think that there's still hope if people can tap into where they are. Yeah, that importance of place. Yeah. And it also makes the conversation around environmentalism so much more simple, just the, that idea of tapping into place reminds you about everything from all of those threads that are connected that we sometimes make more complicated than we need to about, you know, the built form. So built heritage, natural heritage, and intangible heritage, which speaks to the human stories and experiences in those places. But you kind of beautifully sum up that it all comes back to tapping into place. And if you tap into place, all of those elements are a part of it. 
Yeah. I will leave it at that. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time to engage in this discussion, my friend. It's been amazing, especially because I love that we're just on the East Coast and you're on the West Coast. What is it like the nine o'clock there? Uh, yeah, it's ten, more like 10 now, I think. Oh, now? Yeah, it's it's early. So thank you for, uh, for uh, getting up early and for uh, coming in from uh, fishing early to jump in this conversation with us. And thank you all, um, but in particular, uh, uh, Emma, Val, Sonia, all the faces that were speaking back to me as we were speaking to each other for uh, for engaging. It's uh, we have work to do. We know this, but it's optimistic uh, when we feel like that that work is not feeling completely insurmountable, and that we're reminded that we're human beings, and if we just continue to be curious and support each other and walk as uh, my partner in crime today is saying <laughs> with the heightened awareness of place, I think we'll be okay. Um, hello to everyone. And I'm really grateful to be a part of this discussion. This is really dreamy. And thank you to Karen and Kristen, especially for doing all this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you again, Karen and Kui. And I hope we all uh, bring something out of this to enrich the rest of our day and the rest of our week and the rest of our work. Thank you, everyone.